Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Ricardo, you're a very good friend. <laughs> and thank you for the invitation here. I'm really a pleasure and honor to be part of this conference, a very great conference for Latin America and America in general, for, but from the point of view of Chile, it's quite nice to be here and to present our results. So wh what I'm going to speak today is a common work, most of the part with Bernard Hoss from Paris and Brian Kraft from uh, Northwestern. And in fact, I will not address a particular problem. In fact, the, the, the title is, uh, evokes more, I uh, will not say a technique, it's more an object that, is, that start to appear in ergodic theory explicitly at least uh, in the last 15, 10 years. And uh, from our point of view, it, it is quite important to, to, to relate some combinatorial problems to recurrence problem in, in ergodic theory. Uh, so it's, I will try to concentrate on the uh, topological part where I'm uh, more specialist. Uh, but I will try to give you w what is the flavor in the ergodic theory and uh, some recent formulations that put all these uh, concepts of cubes uh, together. Yes, uh, yes. I will arrive to cube at some point, but cube is a cube. Yes, you have to think in a real cube <laughs> or hypercube, uh, and we will try to put on those uh, hypercubes information of a dynamical system and see what this information tell us about some particular properties of uh, the system. Uh, so to, to start with something classical in ergodic theory and to set some context, uh, so I put here the Semerity theorem that says that if you have a big set of the integers, so here big means positive upper Banach density, so S contains some particular patterns. Yes, in this case, the particular pattern is long, arbitrary long arithmetic progressions. Yes? So you fix a length and you know that if your subset of integers is enough big, you will see the pattern of uh, arithmetic progression of that length will be there infinitely many uh, often. What was remarkable in the work of Furstenberg in the 70s is that he, he put this purely combinatorial or number theory problem into an ergodic context. And essentially, he transformed via something that is called the, uh, the, 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 the corresponding principle, thanks, Anthony. <laughs> uh, he put this problem into a, 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 transformed this problem into a recurrence problem in ergodic theory. What is maybe more interesting uh, for the, the talk, in fact, I will not speak on this particular problem, is that f from, from that time, a lot of new combinatorial results start to appear using those techniques from ergodic theory and vice versa. Some uh, new techniques and results from in the combinatorial side just feed uh, new developments in ergodic theory and this interchange uh, or display from one side to the other has been active for the last 15 years at least and really active in the last five and 10 years. Uh, so this is more or less the context where I, I want to, to put the cubes, yes? So just to summarize this kind of introduction, let's say that in ergodic theory, cubes, or what will be called a cube, appears when you study some non-conventional ergodic average. I will just show one. Uh, Miguel Wall show another non-conventional ergodic average on Tuesday. Uh, so when studying some classes of non-conventional ergodic average, you have to deal with cubes, yes? In that case, we will deal with cubes that are defined in the form of a measure, yes? An invariant measure on a special space. In number theory, when you want to find some special prime, uh, patterns in prime numbers, you also deal in some way with cubes. And in combinatorics, when you, you, you want to find more intricate patterns and, and arithmetic uh, progressions, you also deal with cubes. Maybe they're more related with, with the goers norms and, uh, or semi-norms. Uh, uh, I will not speak about that, but this is just to say that cubes is something that start to appear and you cannot avoid it. Yes? Uh, when, when we speak about cubes, and this will be another important uh, word in this talk, appear nil systems. 
In all the previous uh, context problems of non-conventional ergodic average, at some point you deal with the system, yes? And uh, when you try to decompose uh, functions of L2 in some uniform and uh, random part, as Miguel explained uh, on Tuesday, you also deal with something called nil sequences. Nil sequence is a, is a map on the complex uh, from a nil system to the complex, yes? Following an orbit, yes? So these two words uh, are intimately related what I will try to show that, that is a consequence, in fact, of studying cubes. Uh, because how they appear, they appear uh, when you define cubes. Yes. I have not defined cubes for the moment, but you define cubes and you, and you obtain something that is a nil system. When you look to nil system in some way, you have cubes. So this is the link I would like to state here. Uh, when you have cubes and nil systems, in fact, the, the next notion that appears is are special factors or your dynamical system that carry some really relevant and, and very fine uh, properties of recurrence of, of the system. Yes? And when we speak about recurrence in, in ergodic theory, we're speaking in some special combinatorial properties in, in the side of looking patterns in the interest. Yes? So this interplay is what is in the context of uh, what we call cubes. Yes? So just to start with uh, uh, real definitions, I will set my context. Uh, so in ergodic theory, we study what we call abstract or major theoretical dynamical systems. So you have a classical probability space. So your space, your sigma algebra, and, and a probability invariant measure for a transformation that is measurable with respect to this sigma algebra. And in general, I will think in everything is invertible since I'm not doing any proof. Uh, it's not relevant that typically this is the context uh, what, that we are studying. Uh, so when you study measure theoretical system, important notion is ergodicity. So the ergodicity of the system or, or of mu of the transformation either is uh, the same, is that any invariant set has measure zero or one. So essentially you don't have non-trivial invariant sets. Uh, I, I, I show here the sigma algebra because it will be important in our context. Yes? Since I, I will speak about factors, uh, I need to emphasize the fact that we are looking to a special sigma algebra and not another. Uh, in the topological dynamical context, I will be always thinking about a homeomorphism of a compact metric space. Uh, that to make an analogy with ergodicity could be minimal, for example. So minimality means that any orbit is, uh, is dense. Or weaker notion of transitivity that you have at least one uh, dense <coughs> orbit. Uh, when you look to this kind of system, there are always by standard arguments some invariant measures. So, in fact, a uh, topological dynamical system also fits in the previous uh, context of uh, abstract measure theoretical system. Yes? So, when you take the Borel sigma algebra of X, you always have invariant measures. Uh, Okay, so the next notion I will use uh, frequently is the notion of factors. So when you study a dynamical system, either topologically here or measure theoretically, uh, a way to understand the dynamic is to classify its factors. Yes? So what is a factor? In the measure theoretical case is essentially an invariant sub-sigma algebra of, uh, of the sigma algebra X that can also be written in this way. There is a map sending your points from X to Z that also make this uh, diagram commutes. And on the other way, you also send the measure mu to the measure nu here. But the more standard way maybe of thinking about that in ergodic theory just said that you have an invariant sigma algebra. Yeah? So instead of looking to all your, the sets in the sigma algebra X you, that is already invariant, you look to a subclass of uh, invariant set that will uh, classify your dynamics in some aspect. In the topological setting, so what means having an invariant sigma algebra means to have an invariant equivalence relation that is close, yes? That correspond if, to the fibers of a map of this type, yes? So you also can say that there is a map, continuous map from X to C that is onto that make this diagram commute. Uh, so I have my systems, I have the factors that I will use to, to carry some 
part of the information of the dynamical system. In the measure theoretical case, you think about sigma algebras, sub-sigma algebras. And in the topological case, you, you have to localize some equivalence relation that are close and invariant uh, under the transformation. Uh, there are some special factors, classical factors, uh, that we study in ergodic theory and topological dynamics that are related to the spectr spectral theory of, of, uh, of such systems. So one is the classical Kronecker factor. So what carries the Kronecker factor? The, the Kronecker factor is the, is the sigma algebra that contains the information of all your eigenfunctions associated to this operator. Yes? So you, are, you take all the L2 functions such that composed with the transformation are uh, a multiplication by the eigenvalue lambda of your function. Yes? So the Kronecker is a classical factor that uh, <laughs> serves to study the, the eigenvalues of the system or concentrate all the possible compact abelian rotations that are included in my system. A parallel notion in topological dynamics is what is called the maximal equicontinuous factor that essentially, at least in the minimal case, carries the information of the eigenvalues where this function is continuous. Yes, so since I am in the continuous setting here, I need to, to put the same category to the objects I am studying. But essentially, it's, it's a factor that carries the information of all the rotation that you can see inside your system uh, uh, of compact abelian groups. And for a long period, those factors were the unique factors that uh, in some sense were related to rotations in, in an abstract dynamical system. Uh, but with the works of uh, Hora in, in uh, improved uh, non-conventional ergodic average, some other factors appear and improve another kind of rotation yes, that uh, I will show later that in fact you cannot see in the, in the typical, let's say, Typical, maybe it's not a good word because this morning we we'll learn about what means typ typicality or genericity. But, but for classical system we study, uh, you will not see those factors because they, they really collapse in an abelian group. But you need them to understand the dynamics anyway. You need first to know that those uh, factors exist to prove the theorems, even if they could coincide with some abelian rotation. And those factors are nil systems. So what is a nil system? So you have a, a nilpotent group, Lie group, of uh, some degree. So we call this step nilpotent Lie group. So this is a nilpotent group where the nilpotency of order d. You have a co-compact subgroup, discrete co-compact subgroup of gamma. You take the quotient. So this is a this step nil manifold. Uh, so if d is equal to one, we have here just a classical, let's say. Compact abelian groups. Uh, and here you have the action of G by the left through the multiplication by a fixed element. So you have also a rotation from the left. Uh, but here there is no the commutativity property. Uh, so what is a D step nil system? So we will think about those systems as factors of, uh, of another general system, are given by this kind of object plus the Borel sigma algebra, an invariant measure that here is the unique Haar measure associated to the translation, by a single element tau. Yes? So a d-step nil system is just a rotation on a special d-step nil manifold. And you have a natural measure here that is the Haar measure. There is a problem with d-step nil system that we call, in fact, basic d-step nil system, is that they are not, this class is not closed by taking infinite products. Yes, when you have a rotation in a compact abelian group and you take product, you're still a rotation in a compact abelian group, not here. So we are forced, and this is technicality, but in fact we are forced to consider inverse limits of those objects. Yes, so the natural factor for us is not really a D-step nil system, it's, it's an inverse limit of those objects. Yes? Just to not change too much the language, I will say that those are the nil systems, so for the D. Yes? So examples, classical examples, just to fix some ideas. So you have the Heisenberg nil manifold, where your group G is the group of upper triangular matrices with real entries, with diagonal equal to one. Your co-compact subgroup are the integer, <coughs> integers in those coordinates. So this is G over gamma is matrices mode one 
on those coordinates. And if you fix a tau here, this is the kind of map you will see. So you have rotation plus some skew product of the pre previous uh, component here. So it's a classical example. In fact, the, the, in the connects world, those are more or less all the examples. Yes? Maybe I'm going too fast saying that, but more or less those are the examples we, we have. You have non-connex also situations, but uh, just to fix idea, you have to think that more or less the factors we are considering are matrix uh, rotations. Uh, a classical second example is what we call in ergodic theory the classical distal system that where in one coordinate you, you take the two torus and in one coordinate you rotate and the other coordinate you just add something like y plus x if k equal to 1 uh, in the second coordinate, this co-cycle. In fact, this is another way to, to see these kind of factors uh, you can construct using continuous co-cycles uh, in this way. Uh, I will not make the details here, but essentially it's the same context up to some representation of the matrices. Okay, so up to here, so we have an abstract measure theoretical system or topological dynamical system together with a measure, and we, we want to study factors that can carry the information uh, of our system. And this is the place where cubes uh, start to appear. Yes? So in ergodic theory, so I will center in this theorem, by the way, there are more non-conventional and complicated expressions uh, for those kinds of theorems, but maybe this one is the most representative of what has been studied for a long period. So you, you have uh, k different uh, bounded measurable functions, and you, and you iterate your points uh, over an arithmetic progression. Yes? The arithmetic progression has this uh, path, n, and you make this k times. So if you want to prove, for example, that uh, on some big set, say of positive Banach upper density, uh, you have arbitrary long arithmetic progression, you see from here that essentially if you prove that those limits are positive with the correct functions here, you will in some way prove that uh, that result. So that's why proving that the convergence of those uh, objects is important, but also to control if the limit is positive or not. Yes? There are not exp explicit expression of such limits, but at least this can be controlled in different proof uh, by Hoss and Kra and others. Uh, so for proving this theorem, and that's why I'm going to cubes now, one strategy, there are several parts in the strategy, but one part of the strategy is to prove for special functions here. What means a special function? means to, to, to discover some sub-sigma invariant sigma algebra of, the, of x, such that if you take the conditional expectation of your functions there, or in another way, if you take functions that are measurable with respect to this invariant sigma algebra, there the theorem is easy to prove. And what, in the remaining part you can control. Yes, this is a, one of the main ideas of Furstenberg. So, so one technique in proving those theorems is, is to try to really characterize those factors. And uh, in the proof by Hoss and Kra of those uh, theorems, the one important part of 100 pages is to describe more or less I see, those factors. So what they prove is that there is increasing sequence of factors. I will explain what means increasing in a minute. So there is a lot of factors, such that if you want to prove some non-conventional ergodic average, you have to choose the correct factor, take a, a, a function that is measurable there, prove the theorem, and go back. So for example, the classical von Neumann ergodic theorem is, proved, is enough to be proved here in the factor with d equal to 1 that coincides with the Kronecker factor. So if you want to prove uh, the ergodic theorem normal classical von Neumann ergodic theorem, you need to prove for a rotation. Yes? So what they prove, in fact, that there are other factors to prove the other non-conventional ergodic average, but and these uh, factors have a very nice geometrical structure. And the geometric structure appears after you define, in fact, your objects. Uh, and the geometric uh, structure is this one. All of these factors are uh, inverse limit of uh, these step-nil systems. Yes? So, 
to summarize what they prove is that if you want to prove a non-conventional ergodic average, you have to discover what is the nil system where the theorem must be proved and after you conclude by it some standard uh, argument. So what they developed was this picture where you have your system and you have a family of, uh, of factors. Uh, increasing means that if your index is bigger, uh, so the previous system was a factor, so one was a factor of the other, and this finished with the, with the Kronecker factor. I will make the comment after in the topological setting, but it's good to, to, have to say something here that in the classical uh, previous proof of non-conventional ergodic average by Weiss and Fustenberg, they use the hypothesis of weekly mixing. Weekly mixing means that this factor is a point. If this factor is a point, in fact, you can prove that all these factors collapse in a point. So in fact, in that case, you never see the factor where you have to prove uh, the theorem. Yes? And this turns out to be a very interesting property. You, know, you, you have those factors, but when they collapse in the abelian part, you get very, very nice and interesting properties of, of the system. Uh, before this theorem, the unique, let's say, rotation relevant factor was this one, and, and the second one that was uh, developed by Kons and Lesigne in his first proof of uh, some particular case uh, of non-conventional ergodic average. So where cubes appear, uh, so first said that take the upper hypercube of dimension D, and in each vertex of your hypercube, put, put a point of your space. Yes? So such configurations are called cubic elements. So a cubic element is an hypercube with points of your space uh, here. And in this space, you can put a measure, yes? an, an, a special measure that, in fact, we will say that is a cubic measure. Yes? And this measure is used uh, to construct a special semi-norm that is inspired in some Gower's norms in combinatorics of this type. So you integrate over all the cubes that are measured by this special measure that I uh, put in this space uh, of all of the observable f on each of the corners of your cube. This is a semi-norm. And what is very interesting, and that's why the previous factors are related to cubes, for me here, a cube in ergodic theory will be this measure. So it's a measure on this space of cubes. Uh, so this proposition says that if your projection to the d factor is zero, so if you are orthogonal to the uh, nil sigma algebra, this is equivalent to have zero semi-norm d plus one. Yes, we will see that here there's a very nasty notation. Always you have to play between D and D plus one. So I will hope this will not be a problem. But essentially you have a cube, you have a seminorm on the cubes, and this seminorm defines your factor. Yes? Uh, and this was one of the main uh, ingredients, I think, or, in, in, or very important ingredient, the proof of Hoss and Krah that shows that there is these exchange notions of measures in the cubes that really are behind a special factors. Uh, what is really interesting is that this seminorm, in fact, characterizes in a very special way those uh, nil systems. And this is what is called the structure theorem of Hoskra. So you start with an ergodic system and some D, and you want to know if this system itself is an inverse limit of nil system of some degree, here at d minus one. Uh, this is true if only if this norm or semi-norm that is defined using this cubic special measure is a norm. And more interesting from the topological point of view is that if you have a cube that is uh, visible for this measure, in fact, one coordinate can be determined from the rest. Yes? So, uh, so there is a map that if you know more or less all a cube sends you to the missing coordinate. Yes? Uh, and this property that was 
looks like abstract is really uh, turns out after to be very important to determine what the nil system is. Uh, I will not say what is the measure, but just in some words, this measure is constructed in a very classical probabilistic way. It's not some strange measure. When you study the classical uh, von Neumann ergodic theorem, there is a sigma algebra, invariant sigma algebra, that consists of the invariant sets for your transformation. So the first uh, product measure that you construct is just the coupling of the measure of the space with itself over the sigma algebra. When the second measure, now you can go to the next steps in the cubes, considering the invariant set now for that, and you make again the same coupling. Uh, this abstract process, <coughs> in fact, determines the existence of nil system. Uh, in the measure theoretical context, it's quite complicated to explain what a cube is, so that's why I prefer to concentrate in topological case, because once those cubes appear in a form of a measure on the space of hypercubes with point of your space in the corner, uh, so a natural question was if we can do this in a really topological way and following the points. And it turns out that there is a way to do that very explicitly. And, and what is nice is that it makes two things. So first, uh, this notion of coupling invariant sets, but the second one, a way to iterate that uh, mimic the combinatorial problems that uh, appear with the non-conventional ergodic average. So we did this in 2010, and the idea is the following. The idea is, is I want really to fix the way I will put points in the corners of a cube. So since I have a dynamics, XT that I will suppose it is minimal, I will start with the first level of cubes, so just two, two points. I will fix a point and I will iterate this point a certain number of times, yes? So those will be the basis of my cubes. Since uh, this is, is little, I will take the closure of that, yes? At the first level, if the system is transitive, I know that there exists some point that is, which orbit is dense, so I will obtain maybe x times x. Okay, so this is not interesting in the first step for the transitive system. So we, you continue. So you say, how can I fill the corners of an hypercube of dimension 2 now? And the way to do that is, is closing, as in an abelian group, uh, the orbit in two directions. So you fix a point. You iterate in one direction, you iterate in the other direction, and you close in an abelian way uh, your, uh, your cube. So you add uh, both times. Yes. So it's like just filling the cubes very naturally with the structure of uh, C2 here. So how do you do in the next step? So <laughs> in the same way. Yes. So I prefer to give a picture. So you have all these corners, you start with a point, and you iterate in all the di directions, and you close in an additive way all the faces of your cube. Yes? Once you obtain this kind of configurations, you, you take the closure, and you will see all points here. If the system uh, is not weakly mixing, you obtain really in, uh, nice structure of cubes. Yes? You, you will not get all the product space. You will get some precise information uh, of the system that we want to, uh, to see, to what that serve. What is nice in this construction is that you, you are not only filling the corners of the cubes, you are also defining transformations. Yes? So for example here, since here I have N1, N1, N1 and N1, I can move this face up by N1 and I will get a cube. When you see the N2, you can also move this face here and you will get a cube. And if you blow up all the coordinates, you will get a cube. So in fact, here you have cubes, but together with them, you have transformations. Yes? The transformations that consist in moving all the vertices, some face, some other face, or another face. Yes? So we have three possible movements in phase 
and one uh, in T. So the cubes inherit the structure of your dynamical system. In general, in fact, as you understood already what we did, you take your cube, you take a point, you iterate in all the uh, directions, and you close, adding additively uh, all the cube. You take the adherence, uh, and you get the cubes of dimension D, and together with that, you get some transformation that consists in moving your face in all possible directions. Uh, so such a structure of cubes has very nice properties. Uh, the first I said already, this needs a proof that when the cubes are, you, at some step you get that the cubes are everything, that means that the system is weakly mixing. Uh, in particular, if it's weakly mixing, it's enough to compute the cubes for d equal 1, uh, d equal 2, sorry. Since cubes are defined, uh, in some sense, inductively, if you take faces of a little dimension inside a cube of dimension d, what you get at each face is a cube of the previous dimension, so there is a kind of uh, uh, gluing property of previous dim uh, dimensions. Those cubes are invariant also by a lot of symmetries. Yes? If you look your cube in, uh, in a different position, you will still have a cube. And what is very interesting is that this uh, system of cube with those transformations is minimal. So since it's minimal, that means that you can move, you can transform one cube to another. And one of the main consequences of that is the fifth property that says that if you get an incomplete but correct cube, you can complete it. Yes? Uh, it turns out to be a very important property. So suppose I give you this incomplete cube where I know that all the faces are correct, so they are cubes of the previous step. So a question is to know if we can complete the cube to obtain a cube of the next, a correct cube of the next dimension. And the answer is yes, because you, you have enough way to play with uh, this minimality. Yeah? This is the main technical reason. So if, if I summarize, so you, you have created a structure of cubes, so you have a space, X, where, where I can define a complete family of cubes, any dimension, such the faces of previous dimensions are also cubes, such that you can complete in, uh, incomplete cubes, such that they have sev several symmetries. So the question is what that means dynamically. Yes? So it's, a, it's a, an algebraic structure, in some sense, that you have put uh, on your system. Uh, and this is a theorem that is a topological structure theorem. When you define this category, essentially you are a nil system, if and only if you are a d-step nil system, or an inverse limit of d-step nil system, if and only if for cubes of dimension D that are incomplete but with correct faces, you complete in a unique way. So each time you can complete those cubes in a unique way, that means this characterizes a nil system. Yes? So you start with a purely uh, algebraic uh, description and you obtain a, a complete geometrical description of your, of your space. Yes? Uh, a, a, a fortiori, is, a, what you can prove, in fact, that the QD are the support of the measures mu D that represents the cubes in the measure theoretical part, but that you can define explicitly here. Yes? This one coordinate has to be the last coordinate. No, and any, any, any. In fact, here I, I, I put three ways of looking to that. This is a strong way to put, suppose, you, because if you put Y, 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 Y everywhere, this is a good candidate to be a cube. If you put y in the next coordinate, the missing coordinate, this is a cube by definition, yes? So if you have a unique way to complete this y, 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 y with y, you know this is a nil system, in fact. So there's a very easy, or let's say not easy, but because you need to know all the cubes, it's a very simple way to see if you are a nil system just looking to this completion. But in fact, it's any coordinate. Yes. Uh, what is interesting, and I just three slides to show a very recent development by Camarena and Segedi, 
working in graph problems and, and trying to invent or have a very a good point of view of what could be high order Fourier analysis, they follow some previous work by, by Hoss and Kra trying to define uh, axiomatic of cubes in, in, in you know, a very abstract uh, way. And they arrive to a very similar result. In fact, w what they say is that I have a set and I have cubes. So I give you a set and I have a full structure of cubes there. So points in, in the, of your set in the hypercube. They ask three, three properties. I start with this one that essentially coincide with the fact that our system was minimal. That said that in, at the first level, I want to have all possible choice. Uh, the composition property means essentially that cubes of lower uh, dimensions are cubes, when you have a cube. And the last property is that you can complete an incomplete uh, cube. So they, they, they prove abstractly without any dynamics that when you have these three properties, uh, you are on some extra condition, uh, I will not read, you are at an inverse limit of this step nil system. So, in fact, what we get dynamically, it seems to be a general algebraic theory behind. For the moment, we cannot deduce our theorem using this because there's uh, some connexities that you need uh, in the segedi camarena uh, theorem, but it seems that in our factors also, the extensions that are group extension and those groups are, are connects and if this is true, the theory by Camarena and Segedi applies to our, uh, to our context. So finally, it's not the dynamics who is playing the role, it's just the existence of cubes. Of course, cubes are defined with the dynamics, but uh, it's, it's, it's purely algebraic uh, problem. Uh, okay, I, I want to give two applications of because for the moment what we have, we create a structure of cubes and we prove that this structure of cubes characterize the nil factors or the nil systems. Yes? Uh, but can we use it for, to create factors, real factors? And uh, in, in, I, will, I will stay for a minute in the case d equal 2 and I will consider this cube. Yes? Suppose you have a cube at level 2 that is x, y, y, y. What that means by definition? By definition means that, that you, you found a point very close to x such that some iterates are very close to y, y, y. Tn, Tm, Tn plus m. Yes? If I rewrite the Tm and Tns here, I put uh, x prime equal to set and y prime equal to Tn of set. So what you get, in fact, is this picture you get a point that is very close to x, that when you iterate one time, you are close to y, and you get a point that is very close to y, that when you iterate the same time, is very close to y. This, this turns out to be a very classical notion in topological dynamics that is called regionally proximal points. This is the relation that defines the maximal equicontinuous factor, or the maximal rotation, topological rotation factor. So when you see that, so you continue with the next step. So what means a cube of dimension three? Uh, can you localize you know, this property? And uh, so the picture when you go to d equal three is that you will find a point very close to x, a point very close to y, such that when you iterate not only n times, but n, m, and n plus m times, and this corresponds to the left of my cube, uh, you will find another point y prime that doing the same will be very close to y. This is the other side of the cube. Yes? So you have created the new level of the regionally proximal relation. Yes? So we put a name to that and we call this the regionally proximal relation of level two. Yes? So the first one was known as the maximal equicontinuous factor. These cubes, you can look in just those, this kind of cubes, you can try to state new relations, localize new properties of the system with hope that you are looking to some factors that are nil systems. Uh, so, in general, what you said, you said that two points are regionally proximal of degree d if and only if are, there are two closed points for any epsilon such that when you move them in all possible sums 
of a vector of dimension d, they will still be closed. Yes? And uh, what is nice, but it took some time to prove that, that this is a close t cross t invariant equivalence relation. What is difficult to prove that this is an equivalence relation? So in this paper, we prove for the distal case, so when points uh, never, uh, they are all the time uh, at a fixed distance, yes? But uh, Xiao, uh, Song Xiao and Xiang Dongye, they finish the proof, very technical proof uh, for any minimal system, yes? So since this is uh, an invariant equivalence relation, we succeed to define new factors, yes? Uh, and what is interesting is that those factors are maximal, are this step nil factors when the relation is uh, the identity just because the structural theorem, yes? Since we are using this kind of cubes to define the relation, if, if, if the, relation, the relation is the identity when you cannot put x here, you can put just y, yes? So when your relation is trivial, that means that you are a nil system. When it's not trivial, what you define is what is called the maximal the step nil factor. That means that any other nil factor of this degree will factorize through him. So we have captured in this factor all the nil parts inside the system. So the picture you get is this one. You have a minimal topological system. Here you have the maximal equicontinuous factor, and, but it appears a series of new factors here that carry the information of uh, the nil information in your system. Here I put another factor that is called the maximal distal factor that before the theory was the next factor that we could put before the maximal equicontinuous factor, yes? The distal factor is this factor that contains, uh, where you erase all proximality in your system, yes? Or asymptoticity, etc. Okay, so this is the cubes. What, can you prove something else than say that we capture the nil part of the system? That is already a big thing, just to say that you can capture with an easy relation what is nil in your system. And I will show you two applications. So the, the first one is ask what happened when you collapse those, those factors. In fact, as I said previously, in a lot of applications before, uh, let's say, the non-conventional proof, or the, the, the proof of the non-conventional uh, ergodic average, those, those factors were invisible in some sense, yes? But in, why they were invisible? Because in most of the cases we know they collapse on the maximal equicontinuous factor. In fact, they were visible, but they were not nil, they were abelian, yes? So, uh, and this is the first comment, that a nil system has a very special form in its spectrum. So, for example, a nil system has uh, an if, uh, a component of the Lebesgue spectrum of infinite multiplicity. And this is something very rare, at least in, in common system that we study. So that means that for all the system where you, you don't have this kind of uh, component in the spectrum, uh, you will, you will make collapse the nil part. So for example, any weekly mixing system, but I said that before, system with maximal spectral type, this is very technical, but some system that maybe you know, a substitution dynamical system, interval exchange transformations, system of local rank one, I don't know. In ergodic theory, it's a big uh, zoology of uh, systems, and we look to them, and most of them are not <laughs> of this type. What is nice? So what you can get from there? So one application was this one, uh, what is called a Kinchin type result. The Kinchin classical uh, theorem says that essentially that you count the times such that if you take a measurable set, the times such that the measure of A intersection T minus N A is bigger than the measure of, the, the, of A to the square. This is a Kinchin theorem, yes? And this is, and, and, and what it says that this kind of expression, uh, so the ends where this kind of expression was true is synthetic, yes? But it was proved by several papers, but Hoss, uh, Kra, and Bergelson, and some other papers by Chu, 
Francine Icac, Francie, have to read, uh, Francie Kinakis, yes, and others, that in fact this theorem is not true in general, yes, because these nil factors. But when the nil factors collapse, in some sense you are in, 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 a, in a situation such that maybe the theorem is true. And that's what we proved that in, in little more generality that maybe I didn't say something that is not true when the number of terms here is big. Yes, the Kinchin theorem is for k equal to, two, to one. But when you want to put more terms and more polynomials in, in, in this uh, recurrence property, this theorem turns out to be false in general. But when you collapse the factors, but you, know, you need to know that before and to know how you construct such factors, you can prove that the Kinchin theorem is true in this generality, yes? Uh, this is the first application. That is, it's nice in the sense that you show that those factors are playing a role, yes? And when they are invisible, that means that maybe the normal ergodic theory is true, <laughs> yes? But when they are visible, something happens that produces counterexamples and problems. Uh, so here I just put that uh, very easy cases or simple cases, you can prove that the previous theorem is not true. So the King theorem in more coordinates is not true. Another thing that we, we study, and this is the last application, is what is, the, what is the complexity in terms of entropy of such factors? Yes? Uh, some easy computations in simple examples show you that, in fact, when you have an ill system, you are at the scale of polynomial complexity, yes? Uh, but when you concentrate in all these nil factors, uh, or you take all these nil factors of your system, a natural question is to know if you are looking all the polynomial complexity there, yes? So first, you need to prove or to compute <laughs> the complexity or the, the entropy of such factors uh, to verify after it, here we are concentrating the polynomiality uh, in, of, of, of the trajectories. So that's what we did, and uh, so we compute in the Bowen sense the, the n epsilon separated sets. So for those that don't know this notion, so you, you have a topological dynamical system and a distance, and you, 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 you look for points such that, given epsilon and n, you look for points such that the orbits during the first n step are close, epsilon close to one of those points, yes? And you want the minimal number of such points, and you call this the S epsilon n minimal uh, spanning set. We call here the topological complexity, yes? Uh, some result says that, for example, you can characterize rotations on abelian groups just by looking to the complexity, yes? If, if the, the complexity as epsilon n is, is bounded, of course the bound depends on epsilon, but it's bounded with respect to n, you know that this is a rotation of a compact abelian group. So a naive hope is to is try to prove that if your complexity is polynomial, and maybe some more, you know, some geometric extra property, you will be in the nil case. So in that case, you, you will characterize the polynomiality in the complexity just looking to those factors. So a first essay was done here with Dong, Donoso, myself, Song, and Ye. Uh, we, we provide a, an upper bound that is polynomial. And in fact, this is the most natural uh, result. You compute and in fact, you arrive to a polynomial bound, upper bound. But in the second paper, we were more precise and uh, we compute, we proved this polynomial. In fact, just this example to show you why it must be polynomial, in fact, it's not a secret. The, the point is to prove that it's not just an upper bound and to compute exactly what is the polynomial degree if you want to characterize, a, let's say, a D-step nil system by, by this kind of properties. So if you iterate this uh, Heisenberg example, so the unique part where is something interesting here, yes? Because the rotation part will, be, will produce some bounded complexity and it's this skew part that is producing uh, the complexity, yes? And here the complexity will be n, the S, S epsilon uh, complexity. 
So this uh, new theorem, so we succeed to, to compute exactly the complexity, and in fact, the, the, the polynomial is a polynomial, is a half a degree that you can compute from algebraic properties of the element that serve to iterate, yes? I will not go into the detail, but essentially, this element, you, you look the, you pass to the, to the Lie algebra, you look it as a matrix, and you compute some properties of such element, and this is the, the exponent uh, you find here. So this extra property of, of Neil system says that in this category, the cubes produce this polynomial complexity in some sense. For the moment, it's a question if uh, this characterizes the polynomiality, polynomiality, because you have some very stupid counterexamples in Cantor set. So you, you need to handle this part before to, to, to set the correct conjecture. But in any case, the polynomial part is there. Yeah? So there's some analogy with the Gromov, let's say, uh, classification of groups in some sense. Uh, just a last comment before finishing. Just said that there are several other applications of that. There's a very nice one in recurrence, developed by Wang Song and Ye, uh, related to what we call the theory of recurrence sets. There's a long uh, history of problems in ergodic theory where you look for subsets of the integers that where any dynamical system uh, has a recurrent time on this subset of the integer. Yes? So you can construct such uh, sets of recurrence using the regionally proximal relation, and you can eventually address, uh, we address part of this question, but eventually you have start to have some tools to address a very, let's say, complicated but appealing question by Katzen. So that say that if you have a set that, is, that serves to re for recurrence of an abelian groups, it will serve to as a recurrence set also for any minimal system. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Are there any questions? I have two remarks. One is so Gromov's theorem was preceded by Tietz alternative, as you know very well, which mm -hmm. settled the question in the linear case. Is there a sort of setup like, I don't know what linear would even mean here, mm -hmm. is there a sort of setup where you see that polynomial implies new? Just in the constant case, by the way. You know, this is a unique theorem, quite old theorem by us that. So it is also right, so how it's missing here. Yes, it, it, it means the, it, I agree, it means the first step. When it is linear, we don't know if this is a two-step nil. Yes, just because this, very little factors from uh, uh, counter sets or symbolic dynamics, in fact. So what we think that could be true is that when you are in the distal world, this conjecture can, can work for n equal to 1. But I agree that here is like in, in this theorem, what happens is like when you take the product billion groups, is an abelian group, infinite. When you take the multiplication of constant, it's a constant. <laughs> but when you take the multiplication of uh, Polynomials is not longer the same degree, so you need some intelligent way to handle the degree of products. I have a second comment. Uh, you might be aware of this. So you have this axiomatics of cube complex mm -hmm. where you fill in the missing vertices, which was on the key. You might be aware of this is a non-positive geometric condition. Sorry? Do you know of this, that this is conditional that your cube complex has non-positive geometry? Do you know about this? No. Okay, I will tell you. <laughs> What means that hypothesis? This one. You want another hypothesis or? Uh, yeah, what, what does that hypothesis mean? Like that component with the I don't know. You, you, when you have a dynamical system, you have an operator, yes, in L2 that is just composing by T. So you, this is in a Hilbert space, so you can define the spectrum of that operator. 
Yes. So if this operator have a Lebesgue component that it can have, <laughs> yes, and it's infinite multiplicity because there are some multiplicity. This is a, an abstraction uh, imposed by the nil system. I think it is abstract theory of, of that. In fact, I put this one because you can have more systems that are obstructed by that. But it's, it's even simpler in the case of substitution. It's just a complexity problem. Because a substitution, uh, so the, 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 the complexity I put here is uniform in some sense. So since it's uniform, you need that any cover has the same complexity. And in a substitution, for example, with a, yeah, it's not weekly mixing, it's not true. You will have some covers that will have uh, bounded complexity, and, but you need to have some p equal to 1 complexity everywhere. Yeah, so this uniformity kills the nil factors. This, this is the, so the Lebesgue component is just to have a, a higher category of systems, you know, uh, or more systems, but it's very abstract. It, this was proved, by the way, by, we didn't know that. We produced a proof. We present the result to Tubno, and Tubno said in Paris that there's an old result in homogeneous dynamic by uh, Han and Green uh, about uh, this kind of spectra. Uh, we changed a little bit to the case of nil systems with uh, non always simply connected and you get this result. But in fact, you can really compute why it is not. Uh, the reason, in fact, is that in nil system, when you want to be close <coughs> for n times, you, you, you must be close, very, very close at the beginning, like in most of homogeneous dynamics. Yes? You need to be very, very close and, and this control all your dynamics. After. And in substitution, is false. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to introduce myself. There is no anal topological analog of, of, the, of the part of spectrum except the eigenvalue. For the spectral part.